Hi, this is Long. Welcome to our video series on search patterns for the most common studies in radiology. Please note that this is an introduction to study interpretation. An enormous amount of detail is omitted for brevity. Continue dedicated reading, seeing as many cases as possible, and keep getting feedback from subspecialists during the course of your training. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the basic approach to evaluation of a VQ study or ventilation perfusion study. Um, this sort of exam is used to evaluate for pulmonary emboli and to assess for lung uh, function after transplant or prior to pneumonectomy. Um, one of the kind of key considerations here is making sure you have a chest radiograph for comparison and having a sense as to the most recent uh, criteria you're going to use if you're looking for pul pulmonary embolus, um, like the PIOPED criteria, the modified PIOPED 2 criteria is what this um, kind of video is made in reference to. All right, so we're going to take, you know, in terms of the overall approach, like with any sort of study, you want to understand what's going on with the patient, um, understand the baseline appearance or an anatomy of the patient's lungs with prior cross-sectional imaging, you know, know what is the level of suspicion for emboli, whether they be acute or chronic, um, and get a sense as to whether they've had a prior VQ scan. Um, then we're going to do uh, some QI of the study, and then you'll go through looking for, you know, essentially specific uh, findings of mis uh, mismatch defects that correspond to either high probability of pulmonary embolism or that can um, give you rule out criteria, like either a negative study or very low probability. Um, and then, you know, pretty much everything that doesn't fall into like the high probability or the negative slash very low probability um, in modified PIOPED 2 is all, is indeterminate. So you, we're kind of binning into those kind of um, more uh, two, two, two uh, areas on, on the various sides of the spectrum, the very high probability and the low, which, and just everything else is just going to be um, trying to minimize how much we put into that gray zone in the middle. Okay, so let's get started here. Um, this is what a VQ study looks like. Um, first, they're going to you may be provided a couple of the raw images of various anterior and oblique, um, you know, uh, both ventilation and perfusion images and then they will be s summed up in these you know summary images here we, we have here um kind of something where you've got both the perfusion images the ventil you know the ventilation images again perfusion ventilation um in different projections anterior um you know, so here you got anterior anterior um and then right anterior oblique right posterior oblique and then here's going to be the posterior left um anterior oblique, left posterior oblique, okay? And at our institution, we also have kind of uh, images that are inverted and colored, which make it can make it easier to pick out um, mismatched defects. So we'll just, uh, we'll, we'll rely on primarily these images, and you can use these if uh, they're up to your preference or if your institution provides them or something like them. Um, so, so once you understand the clinical context and what the suspicion is for, one of the major things you want to check to see is that if there is a recent chest radiograph, oftentimes like a good thing to think is, is it, was there something done within 24 hours for an acute abnormality? If there has been recent, um, a recent chest radiograph, you want to know, you know, has the patient's symptoms changed since then? Because abnormalities that you see on the VQ scan may represent an abnormality that's not present on the chest radiograph. There's something, you know, superimposed acute since that time. Using prior CT, MRI, or radiographic studies, you want to get a sense as to whether there's anat anatomic variation, whether there's post-surgical change, um, whether there has been prior pulmonary emboli or abnormalities even on prior VQ scans that will give you a baseline appearance of the lung. So the things that you're picking out on the current study represent interval change. So those are kind of essential points of content, you know, uh, context to have, be familiar with. Um, once you start taking a look at the study, and again, these are the raw images, then we're you know kind of use the summary images to, to really evaluate the adequacy um, and come up with uh, what diagnostic information we can from the study. You want to get a get good sense of the counts. You know, the uh, perfusion will have more counts than the ventilation has performed afterwards. Um, typically, you're looking for like, you know, three or so uh, ballpark. Um, you know, here we've got like 500,000 counts and 200,000 counts. Um, generally, you want this to be above two to three thousand, two, two to 300,000 counts. And then on the uh, perfusion, you want 
um, like more than three to 500,000 counts, whatever makes the image look, if, if it were normal or normal areas, look relatively homogeneous uh, along, along parenchyma. Um, once you, and then you, you know, it can be useful, for example, to bring up the chest radiograph uh, side by side with the, uh, with this, the um, ventilation and perfusion images. So again, uh, perfusion, ventilation, perfusion, ventilation. You can have the chest radiograph, uh, you know, on the side to compare when you see abnormalities. Um, and so, first thing we're going to get get a sense of is once you have the chest radiograph, you know when it is relative to the VQ study, have a sense as to where they did the injection, and then probably the most important thing is to under, to look for large perfusion defects. So that's going to be more than 75% of a pulmonary segment or, um, you know, moderate perfusion defects or, or, or any defects that kind of add up to a large perfusion defect. Um, once you find something on a perfusion image, so this set of images and this, and it's good to kind of trace out the periphery of the lung and we're looking for a wedge stage defect. Um, and look to see that it is not matched um, by a defect on the ventilation images and not matched by an abnormality on a chest radiograph, okay? Um, so the radiographic abnormality should be smaller than, than, the, uh, than the defect. Um, so if you, if you find two or more large perfusion defects, that's gonna be like high probability for pulmonary embolus, okay? And so that's gonna be, you know, that's going to be basically a positive PE study. And you want to make sure that you compare that to prior and make and see if there is, um, you know, if that's new since any prior VQ study. Uh, they kind of, you know, if you don't see any perfusion defects at all, um, you know, on these images, uh, then that's going to be basically a negative study. And then there's various criteria within PyoPed 2 or mo modified by, uh, PyoPed 2 that correspond with very low probability. And just like to name a couple of them, you know, non segmental defects, such as like a pleural effusion, cardiomegaly, or an elephantic diaphragm, or per perfusion defects, you know, um, perfusion defects that are actually larger than the radiographic uh, abnormality, you know, um, you know, uh, then, uh, you know, triple match defects in the upper or mid lung. So if you were to see, you know, a perfusion abnormality, a ventilation abnormality, and and then a radiographic abnormality all in the same spot, again, in the upper or mid lung, and then um, two or more ventilation perfusion defects um, in uh, with normal radiographic findings. Um, and, and then a stripe sign, which is where you have a um, you know, uh, a perfusion defect, but then more peripheral to it uh, in the lung, you see normal perfusion, um, which would kind of go against the wedge-shaped you know, shape um, that you would expect if there were uh, a true pulmonary underlying pulmonary embolus. So those are kind of the things you're thinking about. But the major things to keep in mind are to you know um, looking that you're really looking for large systemic defects, and then going through and checking that list of potential patterns of either a normal study or very low probability and putting uh, your particular case into one of those two bins is going to be the most helpful. And basically every other pattern, which you can kind of get into with kind of deeper reading, goes into the indeterminate category and you'll have to do further investigation or correlation across your suspicion of multiple studies to kind of, you know, uh, you know well, well, to um, basically come up to any answer so that your particular study, uh, VQ study, will not be diagnostic. So once you've gotten a sense of the ability of the current VQ study to give you information about pulmonary embolus, you'll look for other potentially non-pulmonary em uh, embolism findings, such as focal hot spots, um, which may result from injected uh, clots in a tube, um, or injection into a port of other or other central line where the blood might clot. You may see central air trapping um, on the ventilation images uh, for, in COPD or heterogeneous perfusion, uh, in, which can occur in numerous um, underlying abnormalities, such as like tumor fat emboli, vasculitis, or if there's not enough particles that were injected. So it's going to be important to look at the clinical scenario and see does the patient have a clinical scenario that would make them make them suspicious for uh, these other types of emboli for, or for an underlying vasculopathy, vasculitis. Um, you're also going to look outside of the lung. So um, 
this is a technetium study, uh, but you know, in in the case of you know, for example, a um, uh, you know, when you when we do one of these sort of studies with with xenon, if you if you if you see something uh, abnormal activity in the right upper quadrant, you may think that there's a fatty liver. Um, if you know these are kind of cone, you know coding down sort of images, um, but if we're seeing renal activity here, you may have uh, zoom out and take a look to see if there's activity projecting at the brain, which would make you think that there's a left to right shunts. Um, and uh, or, or you know a, sh a shunt abnormality, and then take a, and then beyond those sorts of things, if you're seeing air digester tract activity, that would just be swallowed activity during um, ventilation. And then again, similar to other technetium based exams, if you see thyroid, salivary gland, or stomach activity, you can think that there is free technetium, which would be a limitation of the study, or it would um, can give you that uh, that pattern of uh, abnormality. So. To recap, you know, how do we do a basic approach to this VQ study? Um, once you get a sense of what's going on with the patient and taking a look at prior imaging uh, and make sure you have that correlate radiograph of the chest, you want to get a sense at, you know, of the counts, take a look to see if there's been interval change in the patient status since the radiograph, and then eventually look for criteria that match the, modif the modified pyoped to or most recent um, uh, VQ criteria that you're that you're using, and then once you've gone through and looked for pulmonary emboli and changed from any more recent VQ study or you have available, um, you look for non-PE findings such as heterogeneous uh, focal, you know, heterogeneous uh, activity, central air trapping, focal hotspots. You look for activity outside of the lungs as well, and that can give you insight into other conditions or um, you know, free technetium.